desperate like me, please do do feel free to put your hand up. Um, great. Do we have any apologies this morning? Are we all here, Heidi? Uh, we're not all here, but I haven't received any apologies. Okay. We do have a quorum. Great. We have a quorum. That's the main. That's the main importance. So. I then move the motion that the Wellington, um, well, I don't really need to move that we have any apologies because we haven't received any. Okay, um, a conflict you, of Madam, interest. Could I, um, could I give an apology for yes. Bryce Memes um, and from South Warrover District Council? Unfortunately, he's not able to attend this morning. Okay, thank you, Pam. That's thank great. You. Thank you. Heidi, will we move that then? Uh, that won't be moved as Bryce is an officer rather than a member of the joint committee. Okay, thank you. That's great, Heidi. Okay, conflict of interest declarations. I call on members to declare any conflicts of interest that may they may have in relation to the items on the agenda. Do I have any conflicts of interest? Okay, I see none. Now, um, a confirmation of the minutes. Um, I'll need a seconder for this to approve the minutes from the last meeting, but they're the meeting, um, the minutes held from December the 9th that have been circulated. Now, um, Hades just sent these minutes out because upon reading them last night, there was an attachment at the end um, with observations written by David Ledson, independent chairperson of the Kapiti Coast District Council, Merrill waste minimization forum um, and these notes are very I think important for us to discuss today so I would say that we should move these on to items not on the agenda so I will ask for a seconder for the minutes and a seconder that we um, to also move that we put these notes on to items not on the agenda. I'm happy to second. Great, thank you, Steve. I have a seconder. Any debate on that? Great, thank you. Um, can we all vote, please? Is everyone aware of the voting system as well that we have here? And everyone's good with that? Sorry, Laurie, I'm not aware. What is the voting system? Okay, so um, we have a voting system. If you go into the participant list, down at the bottom, there is a tick and a cross. Oh, yes. And so you can tick if you put the green tick if you um, agree. And if you do not, um, you can put the red cross. Cool, thanks. And that's unanimous. Great. Then that has been carried. Next are items not on the agenda. Um, so at this point, we would like to um, formally acknowledge that Councillor David Lee is the new member um, replacing Ros Connolly from Greater Wellington Regional Council. David, would you like to say a few words to that? Yes, it's more of a more of a slight tweak, really. So, <laughs> yes, I'm very happy to be the the principal or the primary contact or a member from GW. So, I, I see a lot of familiar faces. Thank you. Great, David. We welcome you on. Shall we take a vote on that, Heidi? If you could formally move and second that, that would be great. Great. So I will formally move that we um, have a, sw a slight tweak and replace Councillor David Lee as the membership um, for this committee from Greater Wellington Regional Council. Do I have a seconder for that, please? Seconded. Seconded. Great. We'll take two seconders. That's all good. <laughs> <laughs> and can we all go take that to the vote, please? Just waiting on Councillor Edwards. 
great. I've spoken twice now, but that'll be the third <laughs> time. But, yeah. And that's unanimous. Great. Okay. Thank you. Welcome, David. Um, now, I, I think that what we should do is put the notes from um, the last meeting last on the agenda today. Um, or actually, they, they might come out after one of the items around when we're all reporting in, actually. I think it would be a good time to discuss them then. Um, is everybody happy with that? Great. Okay. Please, can someone, don't be bashful about reminding me um, to do that as well. So hopefully you, you'll get a time to scan through. Um, so now we move into the second, well, actually, just, just as the chair, I get a little moment to say hello. So maybe I'll do that before we go into the um, items on the agenda. But I do just want to welcome you all and thank you but, uh, for being here today, but also just to acknowledge the massive time that we've been through since we met last. And um, yeah, it was amazing. That would have been one of the last meetings I was physically in, was with you all at that um, our last committee meeting. And then what has happened then has been quite astounding. Um, I'm sure you've all got your own stories with the waste lens, but one thing that we've certainly learned, and, and hopefully um, Emily and Jennifer might speak to this a little bit later, was that our Wellingtonians really care about their recycling. Um, I believe we had over 3,000 inquiries from constituents, lost count of how many newspaper um, articles. And I think the latest outcome was that so many Wellingtonians stockpiled all of their recycling, trying to do the right thing. Um, and, and as an outfall, it looks like we've had to dump 500 tonnes of recycling into the landfill, which is absolutely huge. So, um, I mean, I think we're still working on getting our learnings after this, but I think a big, big learning there is that we need to question our recycling system. Is it really serving us? And is it really the way forward, being number five down on the waste hierarchy chain? So I'm sure maybe when we're getting together for a drink and a cup of tea, it's something I'd really like to discuss with you all at some point. Um, I got my own little COVID story. I, don't, I managed to make the front page of the newspaper. Um, and this was basically because as a family, we went on a, I, I went on a bit of a zero waste journey with my Fano, And what we did was over four weeks, we made um, 2.5 kg of waste and for our family. And funnily enough, we actually make probably less than that mostly, but it was because we were in this period of lockdown that I really wanted to understand that we could control what was coming into the house, what we were actually making as a family. So as you're all aware that actually for four weeks, normally it's 500 kg per person. So that's quite a significant distance in the amount of waste one family is making over that time. Um, also, some other good news, I think Heidi sent out this morning. Um, oh, actually, yes, that um, carbon emissions. Now, Greater Wellington have just re released a carbon report, so we should each have a, a result on what our emissions are. Um, and for Wellington City, our waste emissions have dropped by 32% between 2001 and 2019. Um, and part of this is due to closed landfills have emitted much less methane um, because the council has invested in gas capture technology. Um, however, te, according to Te Atakura, um, we still account, our waste still accounts for 83.8% of Dub CC's emissions and 2.5 um, million dollars per annum we are spending on ETS. So I think this is something we need to look to report on as part of this plan, because I think that will give a good transparency to our, our um, rates payers on actually what, what they're paying for their waste. Um, annual plan, has everyone had that out? We've had some significant um, work in that. 
where um, we've managed to win the funds or bring the re uh, business case forward for a resource recovery park uh, and funds to project manage this. Also, hopefully to bring analysis forward for our kitchen waste diversion. And in, we kept, uh, rather than the council voted to wipe all council fees, but in the end, we decided to keep our landfill fees up because waste wasn't going away. And then the idea there is that we create more funds to give to waste diversion initiatives and projects. So that's some things that have been going on in Wellington over, over the lockdown period. Um, good. So I'm sure if officers and, and councillors, if you want to respond to some of that um, as part of your reports back, but we'll move to the first item on, of general business, which are the oral reports on key projects. So um, I'll ask our officers to step forward for this. Who would like to go first? I'm thinking maybe I don't not. Mind going first. Yeah, cool, <laughs> Millie. Great. I thought maybe not Wellie since I hogged the show to begin with. Sorry, um, uh, uh, Councillor Fern. The first item is um, governance arrangements. Ah. Heidi, what have I got? I've the one I printed out from you has a different um, agenda priority. Uh, yeah, the agenda that I've created has item 2.1 or reports on key projects. Ah, okay. I must have a wrong one. Sorry. Yes, sorry, Emily. I, I did actually bring that up because I thought when we were talking the other day, it sounded. I've got um, oral reports, then oral update on bylaw, and then the prioritisation of regional actions. Are you comfortable with this, or do you think there's a good reason to spin no, no. it around the other um... way? No, no. No, uh, no. Uh, I think the prioritisation of regional actions is probably uh, slightly more key, but I'm um, happy to kind of go with the um, with the agenda. Okay, so maybe let's just keep keep some time on this because we do have a, an important um, item to actually work on today. So let's say approximately three three minutes per presentation. Is everybody comfortable with that? Great. But if you need to go over and then Heidi, I'll just get you to give me a nudge if we're, we're going too far over time. Great. All yours, Millie. Great. So I'm not sure if it'll take three minutes as um, yeah, the majority of time since our last meeting has been in lockdown. Uh, so out in Upper Hutt, we have reopened the recycling station uh, as of last week. And as to be expected, it's been very uh, busy. So that's operating as it used to, uh, getting emptied every day and then once, uh, every working day and then once in the weekend. Um, our waste model is also under review with councillors at the moment. Uh, so we're discussing the recycling station as, as it currently is. Um, regionally sought waste. Uh, we had, as you said, Laurie, a lot of people concerned about uh, recycling, especially over the lockdown period, which just shows how important it is to the people. So um, Salt Waste has been a really great project to be working on. We have um, the new intern writing content for Salt Waste. Uh, so if there is anything that you want featured on the website, just speak to your officer who will then be able to feed it into the um, content sort of chain that we have. Uh, as well, we've had several of our normal workshops moved online. Uh, for example, across the region, Kate Meads, who normally presents twice a year in each uh, council, has now moved to being online. Uh, so yeah, a bit of um, I like little creases to crinkle out there, but everything seems to be well um, in that space. So yeah, that's about it from me. Thanks, Millie. Interesting. I'm sure we could all write a wee book on what happened after COVID. Maybe we should actually compare notes. I think that would be really useful. Maybe we could start a Google Doc. Okay, who would like to go next? Kia ora, David. Yeah, good morning. Um, 
Yeah, so from um, Potteroo City's perspective, we, we um, obviously have put off our bylaw um, work for a little bit, which I guess we'll cover in, a, in the item shortly. Just from a point of view of our experience through the last um, two plus months, we made a decision here to continue picking up recycling through the lockdown, even though it wasn't being recycled. Um, a, a major part of the reason for that was because um, recycling curbside collection is paid for by way of targeted rates here. In other words, um, whether you put it out or don't put it out, um, you are actually paying for it. So I made the decision fairly early that we would continue to, to keep picking it up. And to some extent, we didn't want um, to, to lose some of the good habits that we've been trying to reinforce over the last sort of six months or so. Um, but messaged out to the community that even though it is um, still being picked up, we made sure that each message we put out also let people know that it was actually going to landfill and that the alternative, of course, is to stockpile it in the meantime. Um, with regards to the landfill, we closed uh, for public as... Um, as everyone else did, but kept our commercials coming in. Um, bulk recycling facility at Spicer closed, trash ballast closed. Um, reopened bulk recycling facility under alert level three, which uh, had its pros and cons. We got completely overwhelmed um, and have yeah, discovered that we really are under capacity as far as our bulk recycling facility goes. Um, in terms of our um, gate revenue um, at Spicer, we lost around 30%, which I'll probably be reporting to the, um, the joint committee at some stage, the um, uh, treatment plant and Spicer landfill joint committee that is. Um, but happily, we've actually picked up a couple of fairly substantial loads of um, commercial material coming in and that'll um, take care of that take care of that um, loss of revenue through April and May. Um, other than that, I think I'll just wait until we discuss the um, bylaw progress later on. Thanks, David. Good. Okay, who will go next? Kia ora, everybody. Um, update from Kaupadi. Um, at the moment, we're running a public information campaign because we're limiting uh, recycling pickup to one, two, and five plastics. Um, that was planned to happen on the 1st of May, got delayed because of COVID. But um, yeah, public is responding quite well to it. A few questions on Facebook here and there, but that's going reasonably positive. Making the changes in our transfer station drop offs through the 1st of July. So, we have done extensive overhaul of our signage using lots of photos, making it as easy as possible for people to understand the message. Um, we've been working away on reviewing our waste levy policy and funding process. Um, our policy was from 2011. And because we need some more room to move when it comes to uh, deciding to spend our levy money as well on infrastructure projects, for example, uh, working with the recommendations of the task force and those kinds of things. It will go back to council on the 30th of July and then we'll advertise our new funding process like we do every year. Um, we're also working away on new options for the Otohanga landfill to um, see if we can establish building and construction and demolition waste facilities there in the near future. Um, we have just before lockdown, I think it was actually two days before lockdown, we had a grants funding commission <laughs> committee where we funded a food waste Pro digester trial, which will be located on the Otohanga landfill, processing the food of six local cafes that have signed up. So um, we're quite excited about that. And hopefully there will be some really good outcomes. We've also funded a food waste composting initiative in Paikakariki, which is set up by um, a few households that are actually going to be um, collecting I think with a bike, with a bike and a trailer, compost from households. And so it's it's small scale, but it's things that we really want to do in the future as well. Um, and then we're going to be 
starting the development of a larger home costing home composting project that we want to run during the next um, financial year. Um, oh yes, we've also funded. Um, I think they already operate in the hut an e waste group to now do proper um, e waste disposal at Capity. We always. Uh, subsidized uh, our operators to take TVs, but we were more reliant on them doing a deal with other people. Uh, and that did happen in the past. And then sometimes it wasn't that successful. So now it's really good that we've got an established uh, group in Capity, making sure that that's going to happen for the future. I'll say something more on the bylaw when we get to that point. Great, Ninka. That sounds exciting. The um, home, the food composting trials. Yeah, sounds good. Who would like to go next? Hut, lower hut. Yeah, sure. Lower? Yay! Thanks, Jun. No worries. I can do that. Um, I'll comment on the bylaw process later on in terms of where Hudson Council is up to, but uh, in terms of key projects. So there's our curbside collection changes. Um, we're just preparing for consultation starting on the 15th of July at this stage. So uh, by um, just to, to recap, we are looking at changing to wheelie bins and a separate glass collection from the current crate only approach. And for rubbish collection, we're looking at, um, there's four options that will go out to the community from weekly and fortnightly rates funded bins uh, versus uh, a fully privatized model for rubbish uh, and versus a pay-as-you-throw model using bins as opposed to bags. And as part of the proposals, we're also looking at um, offering green waste as an opt-in um, service. So that um, decisions on what collection methodology council will go for are expected to be made early September. Uh, and our procurement process for this um, service, for the services actually currently running in parallel. And then a couple of other projects. So one is resource recovery for household items and hazardous uh, waste drop-off to be established at Silver Stream Landfill. Um, that follows work on the business cases in 2019. And that recommended some changes to our transfer station. And at the moment, we're just working through um, what that might actually look like so so in the past there hasn't really been a master plan for what the transfer station looks like which makes it kind of difficult to work out you know if you want to add a new service or change a service or you know how that might look so uh, we're working on that and then a couple of other things there is the um, Wainui Amata clean fill which is scheduled to close in 2022 um, so that consent will finish and there's some work underway to investigate alternative clean fill locations right now. And we're also looking at the potential for recovering construction and demolition waste as part of that. Um, but it's very early on the process. I, I don't have any um, even indicative options at this point. And then the final project um, that we're working on is, is um, looking at a supplementary flare to um, destroy, destroy methane at Silver Stream. We have a new operator that's operating the power plant there. So as part of that, we're looking at, um, could we introduce a supplementary flare over the next few months, the next year? Uh, because there's a strong case uh, for doing that, um, just looking at the, um, the amount of gas that could additionally be destroyed and, and, and help manage our emissions liability at Silver Stream. So those are kind of the three key projects apart from the bylaw. Great, thanks, Jun. That sounds exciting as well. Be keen to talk, see how your um, your new curbside collection changes shape up, especially the opt-in model. Kia ora. Um, David, can I welcome you? Oh yes, yes. Great. Okay. Um, <laughs> shall I have my little um, blue book? I, I guess um, Wellington in the past, we've, um, we've been quiet or almost absent in, in, in the whole waste space. I think it was the, um, based on the, uh, the, the, the thinking that, um, that the, the um, TAs look after landfills, uh, it's, it's their issue. But how I see it, it's actually the, we, Greater Wellington actually has a, has a role to play 
and it is around what you've touched on a bit earlier, which is around the whole the climate change and, and the emissions, because I think um, in the past uh, we've been quite um, uh, we've been insulated from from the, the economic impacts of the ETS. And I think from when I was at Wellington City, it was the um, the liabilities was only about 50,000. 50, and overnight, when the two for one regime came off, now you've got an ETS liability of two million. So I think that's a real signal for the other PAs. And I think as a region, we actually need to look at it through a, also through a climate change lens, and also um, look at it from a product stewardship angle as well. Uh, but also uh, with our spatial planning lens, and that's around land use and transport planning, how we actually get, you know, um, what are we doing with our waste? We're transporting it all across the region. Um, uh, and also we need to look at it from, um, from a GW angle, which is discharge to land and water. And we've kind of touched on that with the um, contamination or leaching of, um, of contaminants into the uh, 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 a ferro stream. So the, the impacts of waste does have, an, have um, an environmental, which is um, discharged to land and water type um, uh, consequences. So I would like to actually look at it from more of um, how we can um, coordinate the reach, the, 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 the big landfills. I'm talking about the Silver Stream, Spicer, and Happy Valley, because currently the they're almost like in competition with each other. But I think as a region, we should uh, think smarter about how we, we manage those landfills. And it's more uh, coordination, but not collusion, because there is that risk of being seen as um, some kind of collusion. And it could be some, uh, like a CCO model for, for the actual landfills so that we can get the best use out of, um, out of those three resources and look at um, waste minimization. So uh, from a GW angle, we want to be part of this um, committee and, and be more proactive and less uh, as just a, as, a, as a monitoring or a regulatory regime. Thank you. David, thank you. I'm sure I, I can speak on behalf of everyone to say those comments are well welcomed. And perhaps in our terms of reference, we can add an amendment to uh, bring some of that corded or, or some of that focus, especially around carbon and our growth strategy, our regional growth strategy to this committee. Thank you. Okay, uh, David, can I just ask you to remember that for when the time comes up that we, we Bring that again, we bring that conversation again to this to that next agenda item. Um, and I'm very sorry, I have um, I'm at home and I have the neighbours uh, are doing their weed eating because it's a lovely sunny day. So I'll get off the mic and maybe hand over to um, David from Masterton. Would that be right, or someone from the Wairarapa? Yes, um, good morning everyone. Uh, David Hopman here from um, Master and District Council, um, looking after the, the Wairapa um, waste contract. So um, the focus for the Wairapa over the last nine months really has been our new wheelie bin recycling service that's rolled out. Um, that and and making sure that uh, we made good we we ensured good buy-in from all the the users um, that was complicated by um, our little break in the middle with with COVID um, as I said we closed all our transfer stations we did have a, a challenge here um, it, it, we closed the transfer stations to all but essential services. But um, we, we do have a, a bit of a unique issue with our rural areas, um, rural users not being a, not having a, a, a rubbish pickups system. So in alert level three, we actually initiated a, a skip system at the transfer stations to just to try to minimise contact. Um, we also continued. We we did stop recycling pickups for two weeks. Um, while we made sure our systems were able to be safely operated, but um, we, we were very fortunate able to start that 
recycling and the recycling sort line that we've just installed here in Masterton. Um, able to keep that recycling going, avoided some of the problems that um, of, of stockpiling. Um, and the focus still is, is just public education, making sure we keep those contamination rates down in our recycling pickups. Um, and we, we're doing pretty reasonably good job there at the moment. Um, the other focus has been the bylaw, which we'll talk about um, separately. And the, the other sort of issue that's, that's happening here in the wire wrapper is we've got a bit of a price war at the moment for um, waste, solid waste pickups. Um, a number of different wheelie bin operators decided to, to target the wire wrapper. Um, that's sort of settling down to a, a, a more of a stable position, but of course it has effects on our budget. So the, all three councils will be challenged a little bit there around where the, where the, the new position in, in, in solid waste is. Um, and we're coming up, we've got some, some long-term planning for waste um, to, to happen. Uh, I think it's a, similar across the regions over the next few years with changes in landfill levies, changes in recycling markets and, and recovery markets, also in food waste um, options. Um, there is work to be done on starting to, to plan to actually implement those over the next few years. So, so that's where the wire app is sitting. Great, thanks, David. Um, I must say I've been too scared to look at those uh, competitive wheelie, privatised wheelie bin people. So um, would be keen to share your experience there. Um, okay, anyone else? Pam, do you want to speak for um, Carterton or Southern? Thanks, um, Laurie. I can only I can only speak on behalf of um, of South Wairapa. Um, Jill would speak on behalf of Carterton. Um, I we've been going through our annual plan process, and in that we've um, had a um, a waste a section on that which we've consulted on, and um, at this stage we've had uh, about five. 600, we've had actually 900 responses to, to our annual plan, which has actually blown us all away. Um, but um, we've, we've consult in the waste area, we've actually consulted on moving from plastic bags to wheelie bins, um, and we've got a majority um, for that. Um, and we're looking at um, the recycling station um, and having recycling bins in, in urban areas rather than just in some of the rural areas. So um, we've had a good uptake on looking at food composting and um, and the one of the biggest ones was the council has moved from um, having a paper-based um, agenda and minute program to a um, electronic one and the um, to continue that, people are, are, are quite pleased with the results and the savings made made in that area. So that's really all. I've, that's our major focus on the on the moment. Um, we go um, on the tenth and the eleventh to do the start of our um, hearings for for the annual plan. So a lot of this will come up again in that. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Pam. And we were all forced on to digital just before lockdown. So that was very useful. I didn't have to make the councillors change their ways. Okay. <laughs> um, it's very good. And it's yeah. very easy once you get used to it. It's, it's lovely. <laughs> I, it is. It's not too bad. Um, I'm sure our DM services team can share about our system, which is working well for us. Cool. Jill, would you be able to speak for, um, for Carterton? Yeah, very brief from me, um, just reiterating what David mentioned in terms of our price war. So really disappointing to see three private companies come in. Oh, sorry, three private companies and obviously the council um, waste collection for uh, solid waste come up the same street. So we're actually having four 
effectively, I think it's three trucks come, come along, which David knows all about. Um, we haven't consulted on our annual plan this year, so that's been one thing we haven't needed to do. And I guess, yes, we're all pretty much digital, except for now one councillor, so we're getting there as well. So that's probably all that's happening in Carterton. Thanks, Jill. Okay, Welly, I'll jump off because my uh, my scrub cutter is right outside the window. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. <laughs> Um, so obviously just um, from a, um, dealing with a massive COVID response, it sort of tied up um, certainly um, my team's time for uh, the last sort of two or three months. It's like a long time ago since we met. Um, and I just key projects we're working on um, outside of that response. Um, obviously our kitchen waste diversion trial was still in the kind of depths of planning for that. We've had a bit of a delay um, due of getting that sort of off the ground due to um, some of the COVID restrictions um, and um, looking like we'll probably kick that off in October, which sort of is about the length that we have been delayed due to the lockdown. Um, and then really just uh, as Laurie mentioned in our annual plan, there's a, um, uh, some funding in there for a resource recovery um, business case or investigating options around that. Uh, and then the only other key thing we're working on, we've had a um, survey done of our um, specific to Wellington City residents around um, their thoughts and behaviours on recycling. Um, we're still working through that data, but um, that will kind of inform how we revamp um, and re-message our curbside recycling um, collateral. And that's about it. Great, thanks, Emily. Um, good to hear. Okay, so um, I think that's everybody. So what we need to do is is put this put the motion that we have received these oral reports from officers to the vote. Is everybody ready to do that? Voting open team. Uh, you just need a seconder. Sorry, Madam Chair. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll second. Great. Uh, I'll take Steve, Steve Taylor as a seconder. Thank you, Heidi, for reminding me. Um, so we'll put that to the vote. So voting is open now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for those reports as well. And that's unanimous. Great. That has been carried. Okay. And so now um, I'm sure one of the things that everybody's waiting for, and I'll just do a time check. Great. We're on 10.13. Um, we are now up to the oral update on the bylaw process. So I would like to ask um, Emily and Emma to, to jump on and, and the floor is all yours. Um, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I guess the intention of um, this seg segment of the meeting was really for each of the council officers to give an update on where they are at with taking the um, uh, the bylaw, draft bylaw to their councils. Um, uh, obviously, we're all going through a process to, um, to adopt that uh, individually. I guess from a Wellington City perspective, um, the draft um, bylaw and um, controls are going to our council on the 18th of uh, this month, so in just over a week, um, and uh, with the intention that that will go out for consultation starting June, July, Emma, is that right? Uh, yes, for, uh, submissions on the 4th of August, the 25th of September, so it's two months almost, yeah. consultation. Um, so that so that's where Wellington City is. I'll just um, hand over, I guess, in sequence to um, each of my um, colleagues around the region, and they'll be able to give you an update of each council and where they're at. Chair, sure, look, um, I'll go next, Madam Chair. If that's all good. Um, from PCC's perspective, we are looking at um, going to council with our statement of proposal for consultation in about mid-July. Um, so a workshop to be run to, to be um, briefing councillors on um, the, the bylaw in the mid to late June, I think it is. So that would mean um, consultation through August 
um, and yeah, not not wanting to put it off any longer, but so that would leave us in, in reasonable sort of the same time frame as um, as the others. Thanks, David. Good news. Who's next? Oh, so I can. Sorry, I can, David, you can. Yeah, the Wairapa. Um, we will be looking at taking the statement of proposal to the three councils here in the Wairapa in July with a similar um, August September consultation process. Thanks, David. And, it, and it's Yun uh, Schatzer here from uh, Lower Hutt. So, our committee paper for the bylaw consultation actually went through in May. And our consultation is scheduled for to start on the 4th of August uh, to the 25th of September with a view to align it across the um, different councils. That's currently on track to start on time. How efficient, Jern. <laughs> well done. You get a chocolate fish for being the first. Excellent. Okay. Sure. For KCDC, we're on a similar time frame. We have briefed the council in February. We have also had a council meeting in February that provided recommendations to the joint committee and the officers for some changes. We've worked on the draft since then, just before lockdown. So it's now a final draft and we are scheduled to go back with a statement of proposal on the 30th of July. So it's a wee while away because we simply had to reprioritize um, and my intention would be to stick to the 4 August 25th September timeframe. So see if we can line up everything to make that happen. And otherwise we may slightly trail behind with about two weeks time. Thanks, Nanka. Millie, yay. Oh, and uh, similar for Upper Hutt, we uh, workshopped in February. We're hoping to get the statement of proposal out by mid July. Um, to be on track for the 4th of August timeframe with alongside most others. Is that everybody? David, you were speaking for the three uh, wider upper councils, is that correct? Yes, we've, we've, um, we had a joint committee um, review the, the bylaw, um, made feedback that came back. And so from that joint committee, it would go to the three separate councils. That's great. Okay. Is there any discussion that anyone needs to have around the bylaw? Any questions or any, any issues while Emma is here? Everybody good? Jackie. There was an issue that I did want to bring up that um, I just don't think has been uh, addressed at all. Um, and that being the um, leaflets and things and letter boxes, I know that there is some, uh, there are bylaw rules and there are industry rules about it, but they're simply not addressing the fact that the, the main uh, producers of these this advertising material are selling advertising based on the amount of letterboxes in their regions, not on the amount of letterboxes that have a, a do not, no, no advertising material sticker or not. Mm. So basically people who are putting up a sticker at the moment that says no advertising material are ensuring that their allocation of kilos of, of, of advertising material is going straight to landfill or recycling faster because it's just, circum it's just circ circumventing their, their letterbox. Um, is there any way that this can be addressed with the industry? And that would be, it is a real concern of mine, um, given that each household has absolutely kilos and kilos per year of this material produced and advertisers are paying for that at, at, at that rate. Good question and observation. Emma, are you there? Able to address? I am. Great. I Hi, am. Emma. Hi. Um, I think it, you've just sort of um, picked up that sort of mechanism of um, reporting back in terms of the male distributor reporting back to the male producer, which is sort of 
outside of the link, so to speak, for us. I mean, we've done the regulatory end and now they need to respond to it and communicate to each other. But we can have a think about how we could put some comms around that to key people. I don't know who they are at this stage, but we can definitely have a think about how we can inform them to um, review their numbers accordingly. I just don't, I don't have the specific, you know, people we'd need okay. to contact at this point. David Down, sorry, from Quarry Rural, do you have anything to add to that? No, Emma, I think you've, you've, um, you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, Minke? Um, yes, we, this was a quite a discussion around the council chambers when we were doing the briefy, briefing, so Jackie has brought it up there as well. And righteously so, because it's an issue. <laughs> it's just not something we're addressing in the bylaw. So this is where you really get into the advocacy role, I think. Um, and that's where we also have a Wellington Regional Waste Forum group. And in the past, that forum has written advocacy letters on behalf of e-waste quite a few times, which were mostly signed by all the mayors of the, of the, of the councils in the forum. So that might be a, an option to consider as well. Um, thank you. Did you have something else, Jackie? Yes, in that case, just uh, at, because of what um, Ninke has just suggested, an advocacy letter, um, is it possible to um, move a recommendation that this forum does go down that track and write and send out an advocacy letter? I think that would be most appropriate. Um, and without getting into detail, I also suggest that in that advocacy letter, we write that if they are going to, um, if they do still see the need to print, can they please do it on recycled paper? And that way we keep the demand for recycled paper in a full circular system. Any thoughts on that? Pam. Um, yes, that, um, Laurie, that was exactly what I was going to say, that we'd had a huge discussion about the advertising inserts that they needed to be on recycling paper because the, the, um, the, the, the people collecting the rubbish and the, and the recycling aren't able to do anything with some of that glossy paper. Mm. I think it's important to, to utilise something that can be recycled and that will decompose over time. Yeah. Jackie, please. Uh uh, yes, could we, um, is there any way that we could also ask the, uh, the industry to audit the numbers of letter boxes that are actually, you know, to, to do an audit annually on the amount of letter boxes that they're actually able to put this material into and have that as some sort of a requirement? As a thought. Um, all really good suggestions. Emma, what are your thoughts um, back on that? I don't think the um, we're in a position to require the industry um, to audit, um, but we can. You can certainly advocate that they, you know, review yeah. their numbers. Yeah. That's and this sounds like it, it would be one of those um, situations that really need to be centralised because I suggest, I, I'm thinking if New World are printing, they're going to be printing for the whole of New Zealand, not just for the Wellington region. Um, so I'm not sure how to make that inquiry. Um, we can certainly start locally um, and that's a good way to send gentle loving pressure to the people to the organisations that are printing, but also this needs to be a national response. Um, I'm not sure what recommendation we could put to that. Emma, do you have any ideas there? How we would uh, send this also to central government or to Wastemans? I think um, given the bylaw is a um, 
I guess firstly, perhaps we should um, wait for the councils to run through their bylaw consultation and adoption processes. And following the adoption of the bylaw, um, have an advocacy letter ready ready to go. Um, and then you can provide specific detail on the legal requirements within the Wellington region. I would have to give that some thought in terms of who are the key stakeholders, but we've, mm. we've got time if that sort of time frame works with you. I, mm. I think um, you'll have, You'll be in a clearer, a clearer. You have a clearer picture of what the requirements actually are when the bylaw, if that section of the bylaw goes through, because we it may get amended through the consultation process. Of course. Sounds sensible. Um, Heidi, have you got uh, the ability to to draft up a recommendation as part of this uh, it, process? Uh, yes. Um, would that be an amendment from another councillor or would you like to move that um, as part of the, the motion, Madam Chair? Um, Jackie, I think it would be great to come from Carpety since you initiated this as being a, an issue around, particularly around your council table. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I, I'm quite happy for a separate, a separate recommendation. Um, and I can't see the original recommendation, so I'm kind of flying here. There, um, there, is, there isn't a recommendation anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ah, thank you. This, this was always going to be a bit of an organic process. So for mm. this bylaw um, agenda item, we were just receiving the information. Okay. Um, and uh, committee... The committee recommends, or the committee will be um, writing a letter, uh, an advocacy letter to the, you know, waste um, advertising material industry. Um, yeah, Heidi, can you help with that? Yeah, on behalf of yeah. the mayors. Uh, yep, yeah, mm -hmm. give me a moment. I'll just draft something briefly. Won't be a second. Um, would anyone like to take a bathroom stop while we do this? Is that useful? Heidi, do you, do you need us to take a wee adjournment? Uh, yeah, we could adjourn for a few moments. Yeah. Steve? Uh, there's a couple of hands. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Order, Steve? Uh, Simon was first, and then I'll go after him if that's okay. Great. Thank you. Simon, would you like to um, have a word? I'm just not sure. Um, I very much support Jackie's uh, proposal to write the letter on, uh, you know, don't, don't only print the number that you need and uh, please use recyclable paper. But I don't think, I don't know whether it's gonna be part of the resolution to ask them to do an audit of letterboxes because they're not oh. the people to ask to do that. Um, they've got a built-in incentive to fudge the figures and um, mm. a financial incentive. And I, I really think we're gonna have to find some other mechanism to find out how many people have got these do not deliver stickers on their, on their letterbox. Um, Steve, I'll let you contribute and then Jackie, you can come back with a reply to that. Uh, thank you. Uh, just in regards to the motion, um, my preference would, would be, it might be stronger if we advocate for a letter to go from the mayors of the region that could be endorsed by the committee rather than an advocacy letter from the committee itself. Um, and I do like the idea of, uh, I think we'd be in a much stronger position um, coming out of the consultation process, given what might occur through the consultation process around the regional bylaw for each of the um, councils. And it, if we do it coming out of that process, um, then we might have some things we might want to put in there as part of that as well. So to clarify, Steve, you're in favour of sending it after the bylaw process? That would be my favour, but I, it would also be getting the mayors of the region yes. to be on board with the letter and that we as a committee um, endorse that. That sounds good. Did you get that, Heidi? Uh, yep, give me one moment. I'll just oh, add that in. <laughs> Jackie, coming back on your... Yeah, yeah just, just a note, knowing from being at, you know, in the industry with having... Um, newspaper deliverer kiddies is that the, all of these flyers are delivered to the, new, the, the, the children contract to, to two separate distribution companies in the country. And I think that those two country, uh, companies who work in opposition to each other do cover the whole country. Um, one of 
the receptor delivery services. So perhaps that they could definitely be identified as stakeholders as those two distribution companies. And just noting, interestingly, um, as a household that we would get eight or nine kilos or more of excess material every week, twice a week delivered to my doors that the, we had to get rid of as a family. Uh, they refused to ever load the vans back up with our excess material that we couldn't deliver because you know we didn't have enough letter boxes. So um, maybe something could be thought about there is actually requiring them to take their waste away themselves. Mm. Yeah, you know, a, a bit of a um, yeah incentive for them. They're not going to want to deal with it either. But, but we are talking tons and tons of printed material that nothing happens with it, except it goes to waste. Can I just yeah. ask a question, particularly Jackie? Mm. Um, any idea how other countries um, around the world, say UK, um, I just did a quick Google search, US don't seem to worry too much, but this, um, South Africa seem to. Do you know how any other countries are dealing with this problem? Or are we going to be the first? I I don't I don't know, and I've never heard of any uh, positive ideas or initiatives. I would imagine, like us, the problem is uh, ignored and not acknowledged. Pam, um, um, I think um, Jackie's suggestion that um, the distributing company has to collect the bulk of the waste that's left over, that will reduce if they have to do, if they're forced to do that, that's going to give that audit process because mm -hmm. they then mm. want to print more than they have to distribute mm. because they won't mm. want to have to take it back and dispose of it. So this is a, a leads to a stewardship mm. issue and a control around mm. stewardship. Yeah. And particularly since we've got trouble with the fibre recycling value at the moment, I think we do yeah. need to be stronger here. Emma, do you have any suggestions on this being part of the bylaw that the distributing company needs to pick up any excess or leftover or be responsible for it? Look, I'd, I'd have to give that some further thought, <laughs> um, but... <laughs> I don't, I don't initially think that would be appropriate, to be honest, or we're, we're um, looking at litter associated, you know, this is a litter, public nuisance litter issue really here, um, and that's what's driven this component in the bylaw, so if, if those flyers were directly, if the leftover flyers were directly related to a massive litter issue, you could probably regulate, um, but if they're just more of an inconvenience for the people who are um, distributing flyers, and you know, I'm, I'm look, I'm not saying it's acceptable but when, I, when I say this, but you know, I've actually spoken to people in the Wellington um, in the recycling team in Wellington, and they don't want to take them in the recycling, but they're actually just a piece That's of paper fine. being put out in someone's recycling, so it's dif difficult to differentiate between the two, and it's not litter at that point, so. It's, a, it's definitely a tricky issue, so I don't have an immediate answer for you, but we can, we'll can give that some more thought and we'll, you know, through the consultation process as well, we can think about that further. Mm. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Really good points. And Emma, Emma, thank you. Could we just put a time frame on when you think it would be reasonable to get back to us with your consolidated thoughts on this? Um, you are the bylaw mastermind. <laughs> not, no, I'm not, but... <laughs> um, well, we can... I'll, I'll give it some thought. We'll talk about it in a in our next steering group meeting with officers. Okay, good. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I think our next joint committee meeting is probably three months away, so I can send you out an update in between now and the next joint committee meeting with where we've, where we've got to with thinking on that. But we won't be changing the bylaw before it goes out um, because we are... Councils, for example, HUT have already adopted the bylaw for public consultation and we are aligning. So their goal is to have a regionally consistent bylaw. So we're not going to be making sort of ad hoc changes at this point, but we yeah. will think it through and get a response. Thanks, um, Emma. Yeah. Okay. Great. Appreciate it. Um, but yeah, just flagging that, that fibre <clears throat> issue. And so 
any other creative ideas on how we approach this would be welcomed. Heidi, how are you going with that recommendation? Uh, you should be able to see it there on the screen now. Right. Uh, happy with that. Um, and there was the part from Steve about the, with endorsement from this committee. Could we just add that? Endorsed by this um, Wellington Regional Waste Manage Management and Minimisation Joint Committee. Sorry, that's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> um, through you, Madam Chair. Um, as it's an amendment from Councillor Elliott, what would you like me to put in? Um, look, I'm happily happy for that. I'm wondering if we can just add it straight on to the end. So comma after council, perhaps. Um, as, in with, as an endorsement. Or, yeah. Or as, yeah, sorry, it might not be correct. Um, endorsed by, endorsed okay. by the Wellington Regional Waste, da da da. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah. Okay, right. I'm moving when you're ready. Yay. Madam Chair. Great. Great, so we are about to, sorry, was it a hand? Can I see a hand? So we're about to um, move this recommendation from Councillor Jackie Elliott on Kapiti. We would put that to the vote. Can we do it at the same time as receiving the information, Heidi? Um, through you, Madam Chair, um, you should first move the original motion to receive the um, information. Somebody would right. need to second. And then at that point, Councillor Elliott should come through with her amendment. Fabulous. Okay. So I would like to move the motion that we have received the oral reports on the bylaw process and coordinated consultation from officers. Do I have a seconder that we have done this? Yeah. Thank you. So that is uh, seconded by Councillor Steve Taylor. Can everybody please vote now? And that's unanimous, thank you. Great, that has been carried. And now can we um, ask for Councillor Jackie Elliott to bring her amendment forward or her recommendation? Do you have a seconder, Councillor Elliott? Um, do I have I a seconder? <laughs> I, will. I will, Madam Chair. Thank you, Pam. Great, thanks, Pam. Sorry to interrupt, Madam Chair, but haven't we lost the, one of the very important bits of Councillor Elliott's recommendation that we're urging the uh, circular industry to only print enough circulars for those letterboxes that don't have those stickers on it? I thought that was the key part of her um, recommendation. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Councillor Edward, sorry. Um, I, I did think that we got to the point where we couldn't um, enforce that or require them to do that. Was I, it, well, does we, anyone? We can't enforce them to use recycled paper either. I thought this was a, a letter urging them to be responsible, use recycled paper and only print the number of um, uh, circulars that they need given you know, the, the number of letterboxes that now have these stickers saying they don't want the material. Councillor Elliott, are you happy um, to Look, thank you for bringing it up, Simon. Um, can I just defer back to staff on that, or to the officers, mm. um, and just see, um, you know, if we can clarify, definitely if we can put this in the in, into the writing of the recommendation, uh, it should be there, you're quite right. So. Agreed. So back to staff. Um, in terms of the recommendation, this, you're recommending a letter of advocacy to come from the mayors. So, um, once the bylaw has um, completed the consultation processes with the councils, we will provide the joint, if this is okay with you, provide the joint committee a draft um, that you will then approach the mayors 
for their support and we'll do it that way. Um, but I think because you're, it's a letter of advocacy, um, you can ask them to sort of um, require, or you can ask them to take into account the numbers of letterbox stickers and their numbers, um, but it's really what the mayors will be comfortable with sending out. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that process that it's, it's happening. Great, as and in, so would you like to amend the recommendation, Councillor Elliott? Um, can we just go back to it? Can I see it up on the screen? Thanks, Heidi. Okay, in support of printing on recycled materials, no, um, in support of uh, the industry only printing uh, the required amount, um, the amount of material that they can practically deliver to letterboxes that no longer have the, um, the, the what do you call the stickers? Um, practically delivered to letterboxes that allow the delivery of this material. And on and on recycled material and with only with recycled material and with recycled materials. Can only be practically delivered to little boxes at the delivery of Yes, that is pretty good. Um, it's a long sentence, um, and I think uh, <laughs> Heidi might want to um, look at that being a long sentence, um, whether or not we can fit in a full stop in a, that's the one. Yep, okay, so I'm happy with that amendment. Thank you again, Councillor Simon, and do we have a seconder? My second to Pam, are you happy with that amendment? Can I ask something? I am. Yes, certainly. Is that you, Steve? Uh, yes. Um, I was just looking at the amendment, um, and it covers some specific issues, but also there might be things that come out of the consultation process that we might want to include. Um, so if looking at the amendment, um, could I suggest that actually what we're advocating for is greater um, responsibility for product stewardship? such as and then the sentences that have been added so that way we're not limiting ourselves to those specific things mm. um, but we're actually the focus is on product stewardship and we want to cover issues such as the use of recycled material for printing and not um, printing more than can actually be physically delivered and anything else that might come up as part of the consultation process when we do the waste minimization pilot. We're in debate. Um, thank you uh, councillor can I just note that for me I feel as though having this recommendation here today is a, a giving record to our conversation and what we want to achieve out of this um, and so, so that it's not forgotten um, and that we get straight back to it and we've got a good guideline of what and, and certainly we will be undertaking stewardship overall when we relook at this. That's great, um, Councillor Elliot. And I just want to acknowledge that it is hard doing these things um, on Zoom, on the fly. <laughs> so I really thank you all for helping to, to design this, this recommendation. So to clarify, was that to add what um, Councillor Taylor put forward or was that a general overarching, this is the direction we're trying to go in? Um, no, I think that I'm quite comfortable with the recommendation as it is because I know that when it comes up, we will all recall this conversation and we will be dealing with entire um, overarching stewardship issues. Great. Councillor Taylor, are you happy with that or do you want to foreshadow? <laughs> I won't make any amendments at this time. Okay, thank you. All right, so are we ready to vote on the amendment? Would you like to have the amendment up so you can see it again? Everyone okay? Okay, so we'll take it to the vote.
so funny. You'll be waiting for me. I can't get to my button. <laughs> there we go. And that's right. unanimous. Right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Personally, I'm thrilled with that, Councillor Elliot. I think it's it's been on my mind. I've lost a bit of sleep over that one, so I'm really pleased to see that come to this committee. Well done. Oh, you're welcome. Great. Um, we and we'll, we'll just vote make... on the substantive as well. Sorry, Madam. Great. So is that for um, the bylaw process? So the whole bylaw? So when you say the substantive, Heidi, what do you mean? Uh, so the substantive is uh, one, to receive the information and two, to write the advocacy letter. I'll pop it up on my screen. Right, Hope. thank you. Great. Everybody ready to vote on the substantive? So we've received the information and we've taken the recommendation that we will write an advocacy letter on the advertising to the advertising material industry. Do we need a seconder for that? Uh, sorry, the substantive is second, uh, moved by you, uh, Madam Chair, and then seconded by Councillor Taylor. We did the vote a little bit out of order, sorry. <laughs> right, okay, good, thank you. That's mm. really a bit confused. All good, let's do that. So we're voting now, thank you. And that's unanimous, thank you. Great, well done. Now I'm going to suggest that before we go to the next one, which is the um, next item on the agenda, which is our most important item today really, is the prioritization of regional actions. So I'm going to suggest that we take an adjournment or a bathroom stop now for the next uh, 10 minutes. Is everybody good with that? Great, Heidi. Um, and so just everybody, please make sure you turn off your sound and your video. Uh, we don't want to be caught with any feather dusters. So um, please do that and we'll see you back here. And actually let's round it to 11 o'clock. Thank you.
Right, Tina Koto, welcome back. Have we got everyone nearly? Councillor Elliot. <clears throat> Heidi, are you ready? We're ready. We're filming. We are still live, yes. Great. Okay, so we are back from our break. I hope everyone managed to get rehydrated. Sorry we couldn't offer you a cup of tea and some biscuits. Um, great. So the next item on the agenda is that we look at the prioritisation of our regional actions. Um, this is looking at our terms of reference and then also prioritising what um, we would like to focus on next as this, as a new triennium. I'd like to bring up here that we're already eight months in, so um, I think we do need to be a little bit ambitious about what we'd like to achieve because time can slip away quickly. And I think I counted there's something like nine more meetings before uh, the end of this triennium. So we're, we're really going to need to keep on track. So can I ask um, officers to bring forward the information around this, around our terms of reference and any suggestions for our prioritisation? And then we'll have a discussion or debate and then we will together come up with our priorities in terms of reference. Yeah, Madam Chair, can I just um, get a little clarification please in respect of what what exactly what exactly sorry you're looking for um, with regards to the terms of reference and how that fits into the prioritisation? Um, my understanding is that we have the terms of reference that have been um, highlighted as an agenda, and I have a, 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 an agenda, one of the attachments. And so my understanding is that we are looking to reconfirm the terms of reference for this committee. So I wouldn't mind just a little bit of background and some discussion on that. But then also um, one of the attachments relates to part B um, action plans uh, and the regional action plan and that we need to prioritize what we want to achieve in this triennium. Is that something officers can speak to or give us a bit of background on? Um, um, through I... you, Madam Chair, sorry. Um, no, my ahead, understanding yeah. of this agenda item was not that the terms of reference needs to be confirmed. Um, that was already confirmed in the 9th of December meeting. Okay, thank you um, for the, the discussion was more just um, what the terms of reference means and what um, can and can't be done through the delegations in the terms of reference. And then Emily was going to speak about um, how the regional actions are prioritized within the realms of the terms of reference. Great. Thank you. So is that Emily or Emma or both? Um, uh, no, so David had um, had put his hand up to lead um, <laughs> this, but um, sorry, that that's um, obviously a miscommunication, um, but I um, agree with what Hedy says. Um, it's not um, for um, the terms of reference to be um, uh, reconfirmed or, or re-debated, although that is within your remit, but um, obviously just noting that the terms, any amendments to the terms of reference need to go back to each of your individual um, councils for them to um, agree as well, but um, that, that's certainly open uh, to to you all as an option. Um, I guess it was um, more just kind of going through um, through them if there were any questions um, from any of the councillors as to um, uh, what they may or um, may not um, want to kind of prioritise and whether that was within the 
um, within the scope of the terms of reference. Um, I might, um, in terms of a background as to how these um, have been arrived um, at uh, in the past, I guess if that's useful context, then um, I'd ask Emma if she could kind of walk you through that process. Uh, yes, so I'll just put my video on because I can't do everything at once for some reason. Um, sorry, bear with me. Okay, um, I work, actually Ninka from Kapiti was here when they originally were established. So the, the broader background, um, please Ninka, just speak up if you, if you feel um, I'm missing something. Um, but I just really wanted to highlight um, the scope of your terms of reference, if it's okay, so that you can I guess be more empowered to make recommendations and set some possibly objectives for your joint committee within your term, um, knowing, understanding, fully understanding that scope. So if we could just, um, I guess the, the key difference that we wanted to clarify um, was the difference between the, the governance arrangement in the terms of, re of reference and the limitations on making decisions and recommendations when it comes to the um, when it comes to matters that affect operational matters that sit within HTA. So if we could just refer to the terms of reference um, and to the first point is to you have the responsibility and authority to accept and consider advice and reports on the implementation of the waste management and minimization plan and the future plans within the region. And I think that highlights when you're setting your priorities that we do actually have um, another WMMP coming up, another review cycle. So that will cross over into the end of your training. Um, so that will be another sort of work or workflow to think about in terms of when you're setting your priorities. Um, and to do that, we also, as councils with landfills, need to undertake waste assessments as well. So there's two key documents that will come out of that. Um, the second point is um, you can make decisions on the implementation aspects of the plan where that matter for decision is not an operational matter that falls under officers' delegated responsibilities and where that matter is provided for in the WMMP already. So it's, you know, we're referring to you've got some regional actions in the action plan there. You need to choose which one is priority to you. And, and I think this is probably quite important, where there is Oh, and or budget has been made available from the territorial authorities for that matter. So um, this joint committee doesn't have a budget. So when you are asking for reports or information that um, is not readily available to officers, we will need to think about funding and capacity to, to provide certain things. Um, the third point is you have the responsibility to monitor and review the management and implementation of the plan. And I think that links back to um, the oral updates that you received today on council, local council action plans and regional actions. Um, and, and more broadly than that, uh, um, Madam Chair, you asked about uh, reporting back on the achievement of the waste minimization targets within the plan and, and we'd spoken informally and in, um, earlier and I'd said you know the data is the key challenge for us we just don't have uh, the baseline data to report on how much is being achieved or not achieved and that links back to the implementation of the national waste data framework and the importance of that and that's another regional action that needs to be delivered um, and it's in the regional action plan. Um, but it's the fourth one is report back to territorial authorities of the region on any aspects of plan implementation, including recommendations for funding of projects um, that are identified in the plan and recommendations for the management of the plan and reports on to effectiveness. So you can report back to TAs if there is a particular issue. And I think you've already highlighted that today um, when you have recommended for uh, advocating and then linking it back to the mayors of the region. So that's your giving effect to that provision there. And the final point is report back to territorial authorities on with any recommended, recommended amendments to the plan or recommendations to the variations of the terms of reference to the joint committee. And that highlights a point that you made earlier, Madam Chair, about any potential amendations um, to the terms of reference would need to go back to the TAs, each TA, each of the ATAs, they'd be debated at that point. Um, and then there'll be a process after that um, in terms of trying to align the council of any um, 
further changes made by the TA level um, back to the Joint Committee. So it will be a, lo a long process and bearing in mind, you know, we were already a significant, significantly a few, a few months in, so we have time to think about there. And that's really, really what I wanted to point out was the difference between the operational um, responsibilities of officers and the separation of the governance structure of the Joint Committee and the role of governance, not operational level decisions which sit within each TA. Are there any other officers in the region that would like to further add to that? Okay, well, I think that's, that's all I have to say. <laughs> but um, are there any questions? <laughs> well done, Emma. <laughs> um, yes, I do. It, does anyone have any questions for, for Emma on, the, on what she's just put forward to us? Um, in that case, I, I have a few questions, Emma. Um, and, and anyone, you know, any of the officers actually, not to put Emma on the spot with this, um, just how, how often do we, we report back to the TAs and when was the last time this committee did that? Like, what's the rhythm of that? Um, it's really an issue-driven reporting process at this point in time. Um, I imagine that when we get to review the WMMP towards the end of your training, we'll have to... Um, have a sort of process of a regular process of reporting back. Uh, uh, I guess that's the formal reporting process, and I'm talking about written reports, perhaps that you want to provide your TA advice and you want it to go out to the region. But as you, as individual councillors, I think um, have an informal reporting um, responsibility. Um, that's you know, that's really up to you to give effect to, and how you do that and when you do that is really over to you. I think to be fair, it's one of the one of the challenges we face and, and possibly an opportunity when we do start tackling these tricky issues like the bylaw, having um, effective advocacy at the committee level back to your TAs is critically important for us as officers to really get that momentum to drive stuff forward. Right, so we, we've got an opportunity to put this in action so. coming up, apart from those that have already got it through their council and ready for consultation. But then yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not just okay. the bylaw, but the, the issues that follow, and there will be many. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up on that, yeah. Emma. <laughs> and, and, and perhaps there's a role for us there too, in terms of yeah. if there's something that we're not being particularly clear on, that we need to improve that clarity for you um, so that you're more enabled to go back to your, your off tech counselors, um, let us know because we can provide extra information if it can be of assistance to you to communicate back. And I know these issues are um, they're difficult. You know, so let us know if we can provide you any more information. Does anyone have any questions around this process? Was that you, Simon? Was that a hand up? Sorry, Councillor Edwards, I'm getting better. <laughs> oh, call me Simon, fine. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether it's a question around the process, but we're about to start a bit of a debate um, uh, about what our priorities should be and, and we're, the, we're the governance, so that's our role. But I was wondering whether officers, um, as the professionals, and and probably we with a greater level of insights than us as to what is going to work or what where we can make the greatest gains, whether they had had any advice on what our priorities should be. Thank you, Simon. Good question. I might just. Um put this back to the chairs of the steering group if that's appropriate. Um, so that's Jern um, and David, if that's possible to answer that question. So yeah, on the it's Jern here from Hart City Council. So in terms of the prioritization issues, um, so, so very clearly the bylaw, we're only halfway through the bylaw process. So we've done a good chunk of the work, but now the rubber hits the road, so to speak, in terms of the bylaws actually um, 
starting their, their political process and to go through the bylaw making process. And so um, it'll be, so, so for the foreseeable future, at least for the next year or so, um, I think closing off that bylaw process still will be an absolute priority for, for councils and, and the committee. Um, so, so I appreciate that some people might think beyond the type bylaw, but let's not count our chickens before the bylaw is actually in place. And um, coming back to the advocacy process that um, Emma talked about, I think it's that there is quite a, a, a role for all the individual um, joint committee members to, to help um, their councillors and the individual councils to um, be up to speed and be, start to be comfortable with what's in the bylaw. Because sometimes we, it can happen that we sort of work in a bit of a um, silo. So we, we work along on a, we beaver away on the bylaw and then it hits the individual councils and some of them may not fully appreciate, you know, the process that has gone, that we've gone through to arrive at that point. And um, it'll be very important to uh, keep the regional template together as much as we can. If that, if, you know, so to avoid basically picking holes into it later on um, for various reasons. So, so coming back to the priorities, I think by, the bylaw will be a priority for the next year to finish that off. And then um, assuming that the licensing system will come in as part of that bylaw, there, there is basically a two year time period for getting ready for putting that into place. So obviously Carpenter's already got licensing, but that's not the case for all the other councils. So, so the follow up priority for the bylaw will be the implementing the licensing system and making that an, an operational reality. So just that's basically just on two of those priorities in the in the in the wider list. Um, any questions on that one so far? Yes, Jürgen, thank you. And I think one of the challenges of a councillor is um, to really appreciate and understand the background work and, and the time allocations, like it's something I'm really challenged to navigate, you know, how long things actually take at the operational level. Um, and also to be empathetic with that whilst having high expectations on, you know, pushing through this. So how would you say we navigate this together? You know, like just some tips. Um, well, I mean, it's it's really positive that, and it's one of the reasons why um, uh, Graham and my colleague and I asked Hutt City Council to delay the consultation until August so that we can actually go through this together with the other councils as much as possible. Mm. Now, and at the moment, the, the plan is that, you know, Wellington and Porirua, uh, possibly, hopefully Carpety as well, and ourselves will go through that bylaw making process at about the same time, which will then help us realize some synergies mm. around um, po possibly not joint comps, but certainly coordinated comps to stakeholders, the wider community and, and you know, stakeholders like the, the waste industry service collectors that would be subject to, for example, the, the licensing scheme. So that when they do one submission, it's kind of relevant to all councils rather than, you know, each individual council doing it on their own time frame, and then you have a service operator that basically has to make four different submissions. Mm. Um, we won't entirely avoid running on different time frames. So there will be some councils that will be a little bit later on, and this is why I was saying the the, the bylaw making process may actually be a priority for the next year or so. Um, the earliest we will close it off will be by the end of this year but until all the councils have that in place we may well push into the into the middle of next year um, so in terms of how we are doing that you know we can do some joint comms but ultimately it also comes back um, to you guys individually to help um, I guess educate your fellow councillors in the individual councils who may not and probably will not know as much about why we have arrived at this point for various issues, whether that's uh, litter from um, mailboxes or whether it's um, minimize, you know, waste management and minimization plans for construction sites. Um, ultimately, the idea is to avoid um, to avoid a situation where we have different councils with different um, requirements. Mm.
does do all the councillors feel uh, confident that they are able to talk with their officers to make sure that they are ready for those that haven't put the bylaw through, um, that that they're able to support with this process? Those more experienced councillors will be well underway. Okay, thank you, Yuen. That's a really good understanding. So then I guess the next question would be, what would you recommend that we start to keep on our horizon as the next priority? Um, and to me, it seems like that uh, the waste data framework is a critical aspect. Uh, so perhaps we could just talk about that for a while because it, it's an important part of knowing where we're going and and how we're how how we're going. So so the waste data framework, th this is where the licensing comes into play. So so some of our councils, Purirua, Wellington, and in the heart, we have got a landfill and we collect some data there. And you know we can basically, to more of, to to some degree, we can decide on our own what sort of data we want to collect. But that doesn't apply to waste collectors except in the case of Kapiti. So, so in order to implement the waste data framework, we actually need the licensing as part of that. So the waste data framework is, is slightly bigger than just the licensing, but it's ultimately reliant on implementing the licensing scheme to, to enable for us to deliver on achieving that objective to get better data. Anyone else from the other offices, Emma, Emily? Do you want to um, add any comment on that? Um, not, I mean, not, not largely. Like, uh, just think, I, I guess um, that without having, without having good, good data to decide or, or to just know where we are, I mean, to have a baseline. It's very difficult to kind of look to to know where, where we should focus our efforts on. Um, so certainly um, as officers, um, that would be that would be our next kind of recommendation for for the next priority is, is um, as a region looking to implement that that um, waste data framework and then we're all collecting information um, in the same way um, and as you says, the bits that we need, um, that we don't have uh, come from those um, those commercial waste collectors. So, um, uh, you know, I guess the bylaw first, then the implementation of licensing provided and assuming that gets across the line in the bylaw um, and then kind of working on the, um, on the, on the data framework. Right. Does anyone yeah. have any questions? Oh, David? Uh, yeah, um, just to add to what, Emily and Yun have just said, I think that um, aside from that key uh, piece of uh, the collecting the data that we need to collect um, through the, the data framework, we also have a number of regulatory um, pressures and influences coming on in the next six to 12 months as well. So there are going to be changes, um, as you will have seen last week in the ETS scheme, there will be uh, changes in the waste levy um, which we would expect within the next 12 months, perhaps. Um, and then also, I don't think we've really got our heads around what influence the Zero Carbon Act is going to be having on our um, waste stream considerations as well. I'm just going to um, park the thought that our best um, next move, once we've got the Bible in place, is, as Emily says, to start getting a, a much better handle on the data so that we can also be responding to those regulatory changes, which might influence the priority. Great. If I may add, Laurie. Yes, um, please, Jackie, is that you? Councillor Fain, it's Emma. Matt, um, thanks, Emma, sorry. Um, I guess it's, the last joint committee chose two things, the bylaw and the implementation of the National Waste Data Framework. And I, I guess I just wanted to highlight that it's important not to underestimate how big these pieces of work are. So when you are setting your priorities, um, just it might not seem like a lot, but they are they're huge. 
So we've got bylaw, national waste data framework, licensing. You want to report, you probably want to report back to councils on the strategic issues to be addressed in the next WMMP, probably later on. Um, you've also signaled that you're interested in um, organics and res resource recovery, and we've already talked about some discrete projects happening at the TA levels. Um, you've got a regional action there which says investigate and if feasible develop and extend the resource recovery network within the region. So we um, and we can report back to you on lessons learned at the TA level and, and feed them back and then you can sort of look at you know look at that from a governance perspective. So and then you've got what David's talking about ETS waste levy changes and those practical recycling issues and things like that that will probably be interested in along this journey. So they're they're huge in itself if they were how are you going to prioritize those? Thanks Emma. I'm, I'm certainly getting that, hence my quietness. <laughs> Kia ora Ninke, do you? Yes, I, I totally agree with what Emma has just summed up, but I do think a priority really is the review of the WMP. So that will actually take up the third year of this triennium in full, especially if we're looking at officers' time and involvement of developing a new plan and a waste assessment there's definitely your focus on data. So it may all come together really nicely, but um, yeah, so basically there are already four really big priorities that will take up available time, definitely from a capacity perspective. Mm. Any other thoughts to contribute to this discussion? Maybe just a brief comment about the uh, regional action regarding the beneficial use of biosolids. So this particular item, uh, my understanding is, is on the agenda for the for Wellington Water in terms of investigate investigative work that they are undertaking. So yeah, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not a priority, but what I'm saying is it might not be a priority for this committee, given that Wellington Water is is the you know the key agency that's working on that mm. through the Wellington Water Committee. Mm. Although I must say the yeah, outcome um, would be agree. A, yeah. What was that, David? Um, so you agree on yeah, that? Just to, yeah, just yeah, agreeing with that. Um, also, Wellington Water actually stands um, to take Wellington Water stands to formulate the very best um, business case in financial terms in in respect of that, um, knowing how much they put through our landfills in terms of um, sludge. So it is sitting with them um, and being um, incorporated into their long-term plan. Yes. Um, however, I would also say for, from a Wellington perspective, I know that's a very high priority because we actually can't minimise waste until that's, well, we're under the, it seems that legislatively we can't minimise our waste in, until we've got a solution there. Um, but what that means for this committee, we've all got a different priority there. Uh, Councillor Fern, maybe, maybe an additional comment around, so when we say priorities, it doesn't mean that there is no work happening under each of those headings. Mm. So it might just be useful to keep in mind. So for example, under regional engagement, um, Millie earlier was talking about um, the sort waste um, joint portal that we now operate between the different councils, which is all about helping households and residents find out more information about how they can minimize waste. And mm. the regional guide for event managers, even though events is not very high on the priority list at the moment, you know, that guidance, that guidance document was developed. So there is some work happening in that. Um, let's call it a bucket. And then yes. um, under optimizing collection systems, uh, you will be aware that there is the work um, done by waste mints um, to look at standardizing how, you know, what sort of materials are recycled, you know, what's collected and how. So again, on this one, there is some work underway. In terms of the resource recovery network, there is also some work to, probably depending on the council at the moment. So I've mentioned earlier that at least at HUT, we're looking at some potential um, opportunities around construction demolition waste in the context of a clean fill that's too close in 2022. 
Mm. We've heard from uh, Carpity earlier that they're looking at, they're doing some work in that space as well. So it probably is a little bit um, council specific, but what I'm, what I'm trying to indicate is that there is work in happening, happening in most of these categories, but whether or not it's a priority from a regional from a yeah. regional perspective is probably a different question. And this is where clearly the bylaw and the, the waste data framework are probably the ones that add the most value at this point in time. I agree that the um, the waste data framework is, is the critical along with the, the scale of the bylaws. So in terms of our recommendation, and I also understand that with the reg regional engagement that that work is critical that that keeps going along as as these other projects are happening um, but really for this group at this stage it is about that implementing the waste data framework and I guess I would question there is is a measurement process or reporting even although we're waiting for the data framework we do know what we are sending to landfill per you know whatever our measurement and so back into section, which isn't actually in the agenda of the plan, but section seven, which talks about monitoring and evaluating progress, which also speaks to the um, attachment in the minutes, which talks about measurement. Is there a way that we can bring an annual measurement of what is going to landfill to this meeting? Um, from the point of view of Spicy, yes, we could. Um, there's no issue there. One of the gaps we would have is understanding the waste types that are yep. coming in. Um, so in terms of overall tonnage and very broad categories can be done, uh, but I'm not sure if it would have so much value unless we were able to um, more closely quantify a you know, higher granularity of exactly what the waste types are coming in. Mm. Does anyone else want to? I think I think ultimately that at this group, that's what I would like to see is some understanding of the measurement of how we are traveling, just in terms of what is going to landfill. And possibly around emissions as well as an annual report. Is that something? Um, how, do, how do other councillors and officers feel about that? So we're reporting back on the plan but also getting a measurement understanding so that we've got something to, to see as a tracked record for each council. Kia ora, Jackie. Mute. Hi, look, um, I must admit when Emma gave her a wee report, I was really surprised and a little bit disappointed to hear that she said that there were no baseline figures. Because um, I just want to assure the newer councillors on board this committee that that was something that we concentrated on from the word go, really the only thing we could do other than starting to do a framework for the plan was to make sure every council and officer went out and got baseline figures because this is ultimately a measurement based outcome. Um, so I just would want to hope that we do have some sort of data that's not nullified for the last two years while this plan's been in action and I would fully support um, not only getting the data framework set up as soon as possible if we need to, but also applying for waste levy funding if we can, if we find that there is a funding shortfall that is going to hold up the setting up of the data framework. So. It might, it might help, Councillor Foon, if, if we briefly comment on the data that went into the, into the plan, my understanding mm. is that the there was a swap done, basically a Wellington Region Waste Assessment in 2016. But that's quite that's quite a substantial piece of work. So a lot of this data that we have as targets in the plan are not measured continuously. So I, you know, even looking at Hutt City Council, um, it's quite challenging to actually look at how are we tracking against just for Lower Hutt as an area, because some of this data is either not measured continuously. And things like, to give you an example, I can't even tell you how much waste per 
population goes into Silver Stream landfill because the geographic source data is not collected. And it's not yeah. straightforward to do this on a day-to-day -day basis either. So the, the waste data framework, the licensing, all these are different components to get to a point where we have better data. But, Wonderful. But, but, um, but mm. looking at doing, a, say, an annual report on how we're tracking against the, the, those targets, um, I mean, correct me, if, correct me anyone from the other offices if I'm wrong, but unless we do uh, basically a repeat of the sort of regional waste assessment every year, we wouldn't be able to do this, you know, give you an update on how we're tracking. Yeah, um, so I, yeah, the, what I was referring to and, and what Ewan refers to there is I can tell you how much tons of material is going to our tip face. Um, and also the, the amount of tons of material diverted in some basic categories. But uh, back in February, I had a um, almost a swap analysis done to be able to understand what was actually going into the tip face in, in quite some detail. It, it was an exercise that cost around 40k. Um, no. But us some incredibly good data, but as you said, it's a difficult thing to keep repeating it over and over again. Also, uh, from that analysis, we be able, we were able to understand how much is coming to southern, sorry, coming into Spicer that is not being generated within the district, and that's an extremely hard thing mm. to track as well. Um, we know that we have waste coming in from well, basically all over the region, and occasionally um, from as far north as Horafanua or even further. Uh, so it's just a very difficult thing to, to keep track of. Um, Laurie? I, yes, oh, sorry. Councillor Elliot. Could I ask officers then what you would think would be the optimum time frame between swap analysis that would be use, most useful to us being able to uh, meet our um, goals? And for funding this, I mean, we absolutely want to support you and ensure that you're well resourced to do that. So uh, would mm. it be appropriate for us to send off for some government funding for, for this, your comments? I would suggest yeah. there might be two ways of doing that. One would be to set a, a, a return period of, of um, call it three years, um, start midway and up to review of the WMMP. The other method could be um, to do it on a trigger of a substantial change in tonnage, either recycling tonnage or tip face tonnage to understand why it's changed or where it's changed. Okay. Thank you. All right, back to you, Laurie, then. But thank you. Thank you very much. I would, um, I mean, I, I think personally, if we don't have a measurement that we can speak to, to look at even mm. generally what we are, what each landfill is bringing in, we cannot go forward. Well, well it'll be, plan. it's with the plan. And so hence, I feel like I might as well um, go and work on something else, to be honest. I mean, sorry, that is, um, not correct because the bylaw what we are doing is most worthy but I think that we do need to get some form of data to understand what each landfill is bringing in as David said so that we can see any spikes ups or downs it is going to answer more questions but I feel like it's it's something I'd like to see produced Emily yes. we are doing it for our annual plan anyway aren't we no so so the trouble with the thing with data is that that um, the the certainly the three landfills in the region we have good data in terms of the in terms of the tonnages, so uh, we can tell you like what's going into into we can tell you the total amount that's going into the landfills. That's not the issue. The issue is we don't know what where that's coming from because we don't we haven't set up the we haven't implemented the framework to allow us to capture that. Now the key key points we need is not just not just tonnages, it's like so talk about the activity source. What what what's what activity is generating that? We don't have that um, across the board. We don't know if it's coming from residents um, uh, we don't know if it's coming from industry or commercial. Um, you know, we, we've got some broad categories that we can kind of split up the waste type. So whether it's green waste or general waste, but beyond that, we don't know. 
and you know as as David was saying we can get and and you were saying about the waste assessment that's a one-off snapshot like at a particular time they're expensive um, and they and they literally only capture like moments in time so for the plan if we're wanting to work out how we're progressing then that that data framework is really key because that means certainly for our landfills when we implement that we'll be able to rec be recording what what activities are generating that waste and the other kind of, and and where we're the best place to focus our efforts on and equally around that um the other kind of key component of the data frame waste National Waste Data Framework is around the geographic source. So at the moment, we don't know, um, and David may have a slightly better idea because he's just recently done a swap, but like I couldn't tell you because we're not collecting that data around where the waste is coming from. Now, anecdotally, you could think, well, some of it's coming from um, you know, from north, but we don't know where because we don't, our systems at the moment don't capture that that information so um, you, you know it's hard, hard to know are we are we if we don't have that kind of geographical source are we are we trying to target something in our region that isn't coming from our region so that that's where you know the the key, the key point is that without having that without having data we can't make any decisions about what we do um, and, and and I guess in terms of time frame um, and and just sort of kind of reconfirming what um, what the rest of my kind of officer colleagues have said lot the bylaw has absolutely consumed this regional group for the last two to three years um, mm. we're all working on our own local actions as that are in the plan plus our other actions plus a good dose of a pandemic in there to kind of mix <laughs> it all up so uh, like Sorry, it, as but, much yeah. as it's key to this joint committee it's absolutely key to officers as well um, mm. and, and we're keen to kind of get going um, with it as soon as we can but but we but just a, I guess an acknowledgement we can't do everything at once despite the fact we would all love to do that so um yeah, I, I, you know, just kind of going back to like the the bylaw and certainly the the waste data framework would be um, where, as officers, we would see the the biggest value in terms of um, for the next yeah. wee while. And uh, if I may just add to yeah. that, so so I think it's useful to differentiate between say uh, key performance indicators and results indicators. So when we look at a result indicator like you know, we want to reduce the amount of waste going to landfill for per capita. I mean, that's something we measure, but, but unless you change something, unless you change something that enables that change to happen, that result indicator is not likely to change. So the input on the input side, we have things like obviously the bylaw we're doing that, you know, we did the regional guide on, on events and um, there is the licensing scheme to get better data going forward. But then there's some other initiatives that each of the individual councils have, like, for example, looking at um, diverting more green waste in case of mm. our proposal to have that opt-in bin. Mm. So, so some of these things should then or can be reasonably expected to then result in a change. So if we do a swap analysis again in the lead up to the next WMMP, well, in theory, we should see a change if that was enough to, 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 to move the dial. Um, but I wouldn't say that, you know, just because we we know every year how much waste we create doesn't necessarily mean that we would that we would do different things in terms of yeah. moving the dial. So I think it's useful to keep in mind that we're not totally blind, flying blind. We we do have these occasional um, times when we do a spot check, and it's not it's actually quite similar to a carbon footprint. There's mm -hmm. really I've been asked before, you know, why don't we do an annual carbon footprint? Well, it's yeah. because it, like unless you change something it's not going to yeah, change right it's not going to so change. so i'm actually looking at doing a carbon footprint every three years and then i'm actually in the meantime i'm working on things to move the dial be that to get from heat you know move into heat pumps at our pools once that has happened i think i'm pretty confident i can then com be confident to say that the, the the emissions in our council are moving down but just doing a um, carbon footprint or a swap for the sake of doing one it's not really going to tell us anything different that we already don't know, that we already yeah. don't, that we already know. Yeah. Um, I just say, just just suggest that um, 
the data wouldn't be for no reason. It would actually be used as an educational tool for us to keep, you know, pushing and prodding at the public um, with, a, with, a, with a soft stick. Um, however, I guess my point was saying that was because that there has uh, been an increase in the national waste levy across the country. Obviously, the government is receiving a large amount of taxpayer money through one source or another for our field. And I just wanted to ensure that Wellington had our fair, our fair, you know, uh, snatch of it and that we put it to, were able to put it to good use if officers felt like it would be useful. Um, can I just add to the swaps? When I started in solid waste in 2010, I was really um, trying to get our data in order. So we actually did three swaps every three years. It cost about $35,000. And then I'm talking 2010, so it's probably up to 40. Like they, it's a really yeah. expensive exercise. After three swaps, it was really clear that was not telling us much. So we were so going to the it, and you would say this is recycling, this is construction. So yeah, you you pick your waste streams apart, but the overall result was the same every three years. So basically, we stopped doing it, and now we're in the same rhythm to do it because of we need to review our WMMP. So that makes way more sense. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I totally agree that on an annual level, you're just spending a whole lot of money. And as Jürgen says, if you not change anything, that swap is not mm -hmm. going to pick up anything either for that reason, because people's behavior more or less stays the same. Yes, you, some things increase, other things decrease slightly, depending on population, the education campaigns you run, all that kind of stuff. And it's a bit the same with the greenhouse emissions. We do do every year simply because we're SEMA registered, so we get audited each year. And we're trying to go to, to be carbon neutral in 25. So we're actually driving projects that drive that change. So for that reason, for us, it's useful to do it every year because we're trying to implement some actions every year. Uh, and for waste, it's just a much longer period that you need to take. And the other issue is, is a geographical issue is a really big one. The waste from Kapiti does not go to any of the landfills in the region, except for from one collector. That's the same mm. for Kapiti. It does not end up in a Wellington regional, in, in Wellington region's landfills. It goes north out of the region. So those geographical things are really, really hard. And then you're just dividing up uh, across population with a number that is not necessarily that meaningful until we get a national approach to what kind of data we're exactly. Oh, sure. oh for sure. Yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, Councillor Edwards, would you like to speak? Yeah, I'm... I'm really uh, happy with the officer's advice that um, I, I don't see the point of spending lots of money every year measuring waste if, uh, you know, when that could be money, we could be spending on initiatives to actually bring down waste. So a, th a three yearly, if that's what's being suggested, um, audit or, or look at our, our waste that's going into landfills and is being collected by recyclables, that, that seems sufficient to tell us whether we're making any progress or not. And I'd rather see any funds that we have uh, you know, directed towards reducing waste. So it seems to me that the officer's advice is sound. Uh, our priority should be to getting this bylaw through, and that will naturally lead on to uh, the, the data framework work that we need to do. And I'm just wondering if there was room for a third priority, and uh, I'm not sure that that necessarily falls on officers, but I'm attracted to the, um, the uh, recommendation in the uh, and some of the priorities in terms of what we could achieve by some lobbying and collaboration in the region. And that's more a governance sort of role because it seems we, we, we are doing all this work on uh, different ways of collecting recyclables and, and uh, uh, all these things that are, going, uh, that are going on, but that's kind of the bottom of the hierarchy. Um, we should be trying to stop some of this waste being generated uh, to start with, you know, um, and, and that's where I wonder whether as governors we could uh, we, we could be more of a mouthpiece for our residents lobbying hard with government and with industry that our residents are sick and tired of overpackaging and, and some of the stuff that cannot be recycled. And I think there'd be a lot of our elected people that could get on board with messages like that and, and get behind us. 
and it's not necessarily an expensive thing for us to do. Good point, uh, Councillor Edwards. I must say I'm very, um, our Wellington team do a really great job on lobbying the council on behalf of Wellington City Council. Um, Emily, could I get some advice on your view on a collaborative um, lobbying to, to government as a, as a region as well? Just if we were going to put in any submissions together? Yeah, sure. I, I think that's, um, you know, I, I think the trouble with trying to do it from a joint perspective is often um, when the go when central government runs um, these submissions are very, very, very short turnaround. Um, and I think as individual councils, we probably struggle to get enough time to respond. I mean, typically those, those consultation periods may be kind of been and gone in between a meeting of um, this joint committee. Um, but um, yeah, I'm certainly, um, I think that's a, a great idea. Uh, where, um, where we are consistent across the region uh, in terms of how we do things. And I know as officers, we're working towards that on some, some small stuff um, that, that's uh, definitely um, a, a role that this, this committee could take up. Good. Councillor Taylor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I did have a, a couple of points I just wanted to note, um, and it's looking through uh, on page 34, our RLM5 is around resilient waste management systems. Um, and I think it's just raising as a note, I don't want to add to officers' workload too much given the amount of work that's going on right at the moment, but I think it's probably quite important that we do um, record some of the lessons that have been learnt around the region through this pandemic. Mm. Um, and don't leave that for too long and perhaps um, getting some collaboration around officer level to uh, look at the shared learnings so it can um, better prepare for if it happens or something similar happens again. Um, and the second question I had uh, or note really um, was making sure we've got uh, coming out of this there's obviously been a huge amount of change to the market um, particularly for recycled products. Um, obviously the drop in oil prices has made um, version plastics a lot cheaper um, than they used to be. Um, so I guess one thing um, I know my council will be very, we'd want to be very certain that we've got a resilient market um, going forward for recycled materials um, and um, seeing how that can be worked into, you know, that kind of assurance going forward so that we don't get caught unawares if something changes, you know, we're quite reliant on a few key players and then suddenly, you know, the China sword had a huge impact, COVID-19 is going to have another massive impact. So we want to make sure we've got a a good robust system going forward. Hmm. What is the action from that for this group then? Councillor Taylor, sorry, what what is it what is the action we could do together to to make sure that we achieve that? Um, I would be prepared to take advice from officers as to what would be the best way forward, but my suspicion would be maybe it might be helpful to have um, a separate report come back to the next meeting, just covering off a couple of those things briefly, but not in too much detail. Um, but I'm happy to take advice on that. Do we have an officer that's able to respond to Councillor Taylor's uh, David, thank yeah. you. <laughs> sure. Um, just just a thought from me um, in respect of the um, last few months. One of the things that became obvious right right from the announcement of Alert Level Four, um, and I hope you can all hear me because perhaps my screen is freezing. It's all right. <laughs> um, sure. So. As um, three waters manager as well, um, I'm occasionally pulled into conversations on our regional lifeline utilities um, plan and note that our solid waste activity is extremely low on the radar when it comes to our lifeline utilities um, and also having been involved in emergency management for um, as, a, as a team member for a while, it's quite low on the radar in terms of emergency management as well. And I think that if we were going to raise the profile of solid waste in terms of both landfill plus collections, plus um, the um, recycling and rubbish collection, um, one of the things that would be helpful is 
for it to be raised on the radar to some extent in terms of the fact that it is an essential service. So in the very first week of, of that, that um, sorry, the very last week of March, to be honest, I'd never heard of an essential services letter and ended up writing about five or six of them within the first few days um, and had approached the EOC, not really on their radar, um, not on Lifeline's radar. I'm just raising that point because it, it was disappointing that as we went through the first couple of weeks of lockdown and the tremendous amount of work that had to be done in order to just keep the service running, there was no impediment in terms of flood, no impediment in terms of earthquakes wrecking roads, and yet uh, it was extremely hard to keep it going. Um, so in terms of resilience, I'm just being a bit broad-minded about it, it's not necessarily natural hazard, obviously, this is, um, you know, lockdown people at home. Um, and I'm sorry, Madam Chair, there was another thought I had going through my mind just then, oh, which was uh, the other thing which I don't think would be too hard to do would be um, for us to present um, the status of our business continuity plans in respect of our solid waste activity as well. So I'm not going to talk for any of the, the, any of the other councils, but certainly as far as our landfill goes, um, what I have learned now is that our BCP um, could do with a bit of a review to make sure that we understand how resilient it would be in the face of um, having to be cut off or restricted. David, um, could you please let me know what a BCP sure. is? <laughs> yes, sorry, yep, Business Continuity Plan. Yep. Um, so out of that, I'm, I'm just going to suggest that one of the things we could do uh, for the committee might be to, to give you some um, let's call it a, a report back on the state of each of our business continuity plans and then perhaps also, and we haven't had a chance to do this since we came out of alert level two, but as an officer group, maybe just share, uh, share our stories, our lockdown stories with each other. Um, I'm sure we all had some, um, some trials in common uh, um, and perhaps come back to the committee at some stage and say, here's the issues that we had in terms of the resilience of our service. Mm. Um, and here's where we think we might be. And now the, B the, the BCPs are an operational matter for each council individually. But I think just um, from what Councillor Edwards is, or Councillor Edwards has just said, sorry, Councillor Taylor, um, that it would be helpful for the, for the committee to understand here's where we're sitting in terms of resilience at the moment. Any thoughts or questions on that? I think that's a really good idea. I think the learning from what we've just been through is really important and sharing that, but also that this committee understands what yeah, just for, the, for us in the future, but also what actually happened and um, how it impacted on this essential service. Are we keen to put that in as a recommendation? Councillor um, Taylor, was that? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, that would be really good to have in there. And mm. uh, I like David's suggestion. Um, obviously, we don't want to get into the operational side of BCP no. too much, but um, just having some um, assurance and certainty that, you know, we've, if this kind of thing happens again, um, we're much better prepared for it. Um, and hopefully not so much officer time is taken up trying to do things which really should mm. be. Um, not having to show that solid waste is an essential service because it really should be. Um, that would be great. Thanks. Great. Um, Heidi, are you able to put together a recommendation um, that outlines that while we continue discussion and then we can take that to the vote? Yep, sure. Um, so I would like to then now, if we're all ready to come back to our priorities, as that's what we'd, we want to get, get through today. This has been a very healthy discussion. Um, We've got no doubt, I don't think that we're understanding the scale and the immense, but also the opportunity we have ahead in the bylaw. And also just want to acknowledge all officers work on this so far. That's been, it is massive and it's still going to go on, but it does give us a lot of opportunity to start really uh, putting in some good, good behavior changes there. So 
that's no doubt the priority. Um, second, I also agree that the implementation of the waste data framework is really important. But I also want to bring in um, Councillor Elliott's suggestion that do we um, go for some waste levy funding as a group to really have somebody starting to work on this, to, to make a plan and to start working on getting this, this framework in place for this? Councillor Elliott, is that what you were you were implying? You're still muted, Councillor Elliott. Look, I think that would be wonderful if, if officers feel as though it would enhance their ability to deliver um, and, and use the data framework then definitely. So that would be a cent another centralised uh, position, if you like? Yes, yes it would be, yeah. Do officers want to give us some feedback on that? Ninke? Yeah, unfortunately, my direct feedback is that in the Livy budget we have available in Kapiti, there is no place for us to fund a second officer, regional officer. Sorry. Not unless oh, we not get sure. way more levy money, but um, we don't rates fund anything in waste. I'm okay. not talking about rates funding. I'm talking about getting central government funding to us more government funding and um, to assist you in your work. So the waste levy fund that is made available by MFE once or twice a year has distinct priorities in them. And um, you would really apply for project funding rather than trying via that central funding mechanism, uh, pay for another regional officer to implement this kind of work. I don't believe maybe another officer can jump in here, but uh, on the current funding rounds, there's very specific priorities that you can- I'm apply. sure they do have here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nika, I can, I can provide some additional um, context for that. So there's the MFE fund, but they do tend to focus on big capital investments and infrastructure changes, certainly in the last round. Mm. Um, in terms of the waste levies funds that that each individual council gets. I mean, that's based on population. Um, so it's basically the levy is collected at different landfills across the country. And then as half of that money goes back to councils on a population basis. So some of the smaller councils will have relatively small amounts of waste levy funding, which they will use for all sorts of um, initiatives. Um, some of the larger ones have, have a, you know, depending on their population. So, so if the question is, um, increasing the amount of resources available in terms of staff time, it really depends on how waste is structured within the, in each council. So some councils fund staff out of waste minimization staff out of waste levies, others don't. It really depends on the individual council. Okay. Thank you. Is it worth asking for a report back on how we might do that and what the benefits for us to accelerate this for the next meeting? That means someone yes. would have to do the work? Councillor Foon, so are you, are you asking, is, was that a question to officers or? Uh, yes, so sorry. So I guess the suggestion was, is it worth, um, yes, could we bring a report back to this committee in the next three months that outlines some possible ways on how we might do that and a research into the fund to see if it was applicable? For example, um, I'm hoping to meet with Minister Sage in the next month and it's something I could talk about with her. No. and work out if it was a possibility. So the report so, so, would need so to say how we would do it, what the possible options are, and what, what way we would progress, and what benefit it would bring. Yeah, my question is, is that in relation to increasing the amount of staff, or is it in relation to particular projects? It's um, in relation to implementing the data framework. Okay. Kia ora, Simon Edwards. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Edwards, sorry. Did I misunderstand uh, officer's advice earlier? Um, I thought I heard uh, advice to us was that um, once we have the waste, the, the bylaw in place and we uh, uh, bed in the system of licensing operators, 
that's going to be the way that we're going to get the um, sorts of data that we need rather than spending lots of money sort of collecting it and, and so on. Is that, is that what I heard? Yep. That, that's Roger that. Yeah. So that, that's, that's basically what I explained earlier. So I guess I'm just, I was trying to understand Councillor Foon's yeah. question yeah. in terms of what exactly we, that report that you've just mentioned, what would that, what's the question we're trying to answer basically? I think the question we're trying to answer as I understand that if we understand what options we have to go forward to accelerate bringing the, the um, waste data framework right. forward. Can I respond? That, is there an opportunity for government to fund that? Yes, that would be welcomed, Emma. <laughs> um, I guess the implementation of the National Waste Data Framework for us um, will be reliant on the implementation of the bylaw and it's a body of work that's going to take a couple of years. We need to engage industry. It's a significant, potentially significant change for them. Um, so we've given ourselves two years. The, by, the licensing system will primarily operate on a user pays basis. So when people apply for a license, um, they will cover the cost of the administra administration of processing, processing of that license. We may need some funds to establish a regional data system where we can collate the information and hold it securely but we don't know at this point we have, you know we need to do a bit more work to establish what costs we're looking at there potentially that could be a waste um, waste fund opportunity for the region um, one thing we could do is ask an officer from MFE to speak to you about accessing the waste minimization um, levy and the process rather than a report from us just mm. get a speaker and to speak to you um, directly to the joint committee and speak to it. I don't know if they will but we could ask. Mm. That's a good useful. idea. It sounds like a good idea for to have an officer from MFA to come and speak maybe on an, an, a future agenda. It really does. Um, so look, thank you, Emma, for that clarification. We just want to ensure that, 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 that you're fully reserved to do, um, uh, you know, have funded to do the best job that you can do. Yeah. I guess we just need some more thinking and time to, to get some costs together on um, sure. just really the data system, I think, um, unless someone else would like to add to that, but it, primarily the processing administration costs will come in with the, be covered by a fee for the license from the applicant. Okay. Can I ask um, officers that next time we meet, what I would like to do when we vote here on our priorities is see a timeline, because this is something that is resonating with me today, is actually how long these things take, how things work in tandem with each other. For example, if the bylaw is going to take approximately two years to implement, get running, and then we get the data framework working in tandem alongside that. When does that come in? So um, I'm, a, I'm a visual person, so I would really like to see some kind of drawing on how this looks going forward. And then where we might need things like the, the funding to come in. How does that sound? Uh, you in here from Hutt City Council. I think that's achievable. Yeah. Um, to, to give you a little bit more of an overview of the timeframes required for different things. Great. Can we make that a recommendation for the next meeting, please? Heidi, are you able to put that together? Yep, I'll include that. Thank you. Um, I do have another recommendation still, and that is that I would like to see a document, an annual document that line by line brings each council's waste, what they brought to the landfill. I understand that geographically it doesn't, you know, complete, give us a really good idea of where it's coming from and what was diverted um, by recycling or, or um, yeah, anything, anything that was diverted put into one sum. And I'd also like to see emissions from each council annually if you've got that data and you're able to bring it. I think that would be really useful to look at a snapshot as, as a region 
to be able to say this is what we're producing and it will give us uh, and the public some understanding of really what we've got there. And I, I do, if we've got the data, it, it will be an administrative job to pull this together. Can I have officers uh, feedback on that, please? Um, I can probably briefly talk to that. Um, so, so in terms of reporting against the actions in the WMMP, which is a little bit different to what you've just asked, I think that's achievable because it's really, and, and it's probably, and it's something we've started working on already anyway, to potentially give to you on the September meeting to go line by line through the WMP and say, okay, well, where's each council up to? Where are we up to with those regional actions? And that could include some timeframes. Now, with regard to that annual report, the the availability of data will be very will be make that will make this quite limited. So, and I'll tell you why. So, one is when it comes to emissions data, a lot of our councils don't have that annually. Um, even I mean, for our own council, I don't have that. We don't do an annual carbon footprint. It's just not worth doing that. Um, although we do have some indicators that we use, um, and we report on that for our for our committee on the carbon side of things. On the waste side of things, I mean, as David explained earlier and Emily, so we have some reasonably you know, available data on the tonnage that goes into the different landfills. And for Silverstream, that's about 120,000 tons a year. Once you start digging into the granular data, it's very limited. So we don't have, as we explained earlier, there's no geographic um, source data yet. There's very limited data on activity sources, you know, the types of industries. And in terms of what's diverted, I mean, for Silverstream, we could report on, well, what's coming out again in terms of what, you know, brick and brack and, and some green waste or, or some other materials that might have come out. But the majority of items don't ever come to the landfill. They're diverted before that. Mm. So think about the Macaulay's metals of this world that recycled metal. None of this data is currently available. Um, I mean, we do have some data on the amount of recycling collected. Um, you know, for Hut City, that's about seven thousand tons a year. But that's quite a that's quite that that does that data is very limited. So we don't have anything on, you know, all the other things that actually never never go to the to, to the landfill that is actually diverted beforehand. Mm. That's where the data framework comes in. So I just want to manage expectations around that report that you're after. I think it will be quite limited in terms of what you'd be able to read out of this or take out of that, um, other than total tonnage going to landfill and some of the things where we have some data on. It certainly won't give you the picture that we're after through the implementation of the licensing and the implementation of the wider waste data framework. Um, Emily or David, do you want to add anything to this or? Yeah, I would. I would just say, um, like in terms of, like particularly, if we're talking about recycling, and we we all, you know, and we know. So we know what's going into our landfills as a total tonnage. We know what we're picking up at curbside for recycling. But as Yun says, lots of that we don't we don't have any interaction with. I've got no idea what levels of commercial recycling are being picked up around the city. This is something you know, without that sort of. I guess without that licensing framework to enable to co to collect better data, what we would present to you is just what we know, and it's not knowing what we don't know. So we can we can provide you with what we do know, but but note that it's absolutely nowhere near the full picture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll just and, and agree with um, one of the reasons I had the February um, report done for us was to understand the difference between our residential tonnage coming in and our business tonnage coming in that, that had to be done in a in um, quite a targeted sort of way just to understand even five days worth um, the other thing I just want to drop in too is in terms of the waste minimization sorry the waste management the WMA um, we are each responsible for management and minimization of waste within our own district where the picture gets really difficult to understand is a lot of the stuff that comes into our district is not our districts. It's <laughs> from anywhere. Um, so the view I take is that so long as we're doing our part in respect of our residents, um, that you know it's important. It's important for um, purposes of meeting that particular part of the WMA. 
but also having to understand where it's coming from geographically. Back to the point that was made before, mm. which we really can't tell. Mm. I guess if we're looking at the the regional growth, you know, uh, committee that's that's there at the moment, we need to view this regionally, um, and and ideally, it's worth asking ourselves if we need one landfill in the future. I know it's a sustainability wise for the residents in Wellington, it is not just not tolerable to go on at the rate that they are. So if we don't have an idea of what we're producing as a region, we can't act on it. So I would really like this data to come to this committee, please. Even if it's got holes, and I'd also like it to be backtracked a couple of years too, so we can at least start to see some patterns. Um, could I suggest then, if we're going to bring that report to the committee, one of the very valuable things is to make sure that we've said here is what we do know, but additionally, here's the stuff we don't know. Yes, exactly. Which then and, and logically leads into the um, framework. Yeah, thank you. And it's a, it's a precursor to that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah, and for each council, the what we don't know are different. So probably each council needs to say, this is where my data come from. This is the cavity picture. And here mm. are my, you know, <laughs> notes to say, this is what I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Really and, individually. And, and we might get some learnings from that, but it's really just starting to get a regional picture of what we look like. And then when we go into the the, the big piece on the day, on the uh, waste data framework, then we've got you know we've got something that we're looking at to come from. But to be able to speak to our waste problem, this data would be really useful. Um, can I ask, Heidi, could you bring that as a recommendation, um, please? But I will let officers advise on when the best dates like do you measure annually to the end of June 31st does that tend to be do you tend to move it with the annual um, the end of the financial year uh, well for it I don't know I can't speak for the others but looking at the heart um, we can cut the data either way okay same for us it doesn't matter yeah. okay and same for us Emily, and, do we? No, yeah. it's we're in line with the, the rest of the councils. Okay, so any time? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would prefer that it goes in line with the financial year myself. Does anyone have an objection to that? Assuming we all go to the end of uh, June 31st as a financial year, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yep, okay, so let's take the snapshot like that. So Heidi, the recommendation is that we um, bring a, a report back to the next committee that look, that, um, gives an account of, right, I think I wrote in, um, um, I'll just share with, share my screen with what I've noted so far. Thank you. And I, I'm happy for any input here. Oh, it's looking like a lot of red. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> I'm just also being mindful of time. People were at 20 past 12 and I would like to get you away by 1230. Great. Um, Heidi, can I get you to add in um, carbon emissions and just put optional? It's a voluntary thing. Into uh, the list for the annual number report. five. Yes, please. 
Um, Laurie, can I just raise another issue while, just quickly while we are going through this? Yes. I just wanted to um, just check back in with um, the councillor um, who spoke about a, a, a governance role as lobby, lobbyists. Yes. Sorry, I can't see your name right now. Is it Steve Edwards? Steve, Steve um, Simon. No, Simon Edwards. Simon, um, I just wondered if you wanted to um, maybe have added to this recommendation something like that that, that, is, that a small um, lobbying group is set up and that we work uh, outside of the meetings by email and if any opportunities have come up to make submissions that it's done by email between to get a consensus from from uh, governance to go ahead and send through a submission and I don't know sorry uh, if the um, terms of reference and things of this group allow for that to happen so I need to quick check back on that too but I wanted to know how you felt about that Simon Uh, basically, <laughs> anything that um, that increases the opportunity for, for putting pressure on government for product stewardship and, and stuff like that, I'd mm. be never of. Um, and I, I I can't see why uh, this uh, joint committee can't be a sort of a champion for those sorts of initiatives. And and um, I I also can't see why actually why it can't be higher up on our priority list given that some of those other things we probably have not got the money or the officer time to achieve. So, so we try to put that into a recommendation there. Well, my recommendation inviting you. That, that our um, that coll collaboration and lobbying be our third priority after, after um, the getting the bylaw through and the, and the data data framework. Okay. I, I would support that. I'm happy to support that. Great. Heidi, can you put your, um, yeah, great. Could you put your um, screen back? Thank you. Is everyone ready to read this and take a, a vote now? Are we feeling like we're in that right that position? Kia ora Pam, can you can, can I just Sorry. can I just suggest that in that last point where we talk about an annual report that the dates the first of July to the thirtieth of June go in there because otherwise in the future it, they may take it to January to December or something like that. Yeah, thank you, Pam. And can we also, Heidi, have that backdated for three years? Uh, bear with me one moment. So for the annual report, the dates... Sorry, Councillor Colenso, if you could just repeat that. Um, the, the dates are from the 1st of July of the year to the 30th of June of the following year. Okay. Great. And, and so now we've kept the priorities largely as they were, apart from pulling up collaborate and lobbying into number three. Great. Um, Councillors, members of the committee, are you ready to vote? Through you, Madam Chair, you just need to move the motion first and then ask for a seconder. Thank you very much, Heidi. <laughs> right, I move the motion that we um, have put our priorities. Happy to second. Great, Count thank you. And, and a list of recommendations. Thank you for seconding Councillor Edwards. Can I now ask you to vote accordingly? And that's unanimous. Great. Well Great. done, team. OK. Um, can I just congratulate everybody in offices, especially because it is very hard online. And I really appreciate that 
some of this discussion hasn't uh, got a, it, it's a new background for many of us. So I just want to acknowledge and thank everybody for their support on this. Um, Kia ora, Councillor Elliott. Madam Chair, when we first opened this meeting, you suggested that you wanted to add the Capiti um, Mayoral Task Force on Waste um, Outcomes to the agenda, but there appears not to be time. Can I ask that that be put on the following agenda? I would second that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so a, re a recommendation from Councillor um, Elliott that we put the agenda item that we spoke about at the beginning from the minutes of December 9. Yeah, which is the yep. yeah, Cap Capity Mayoral Task Force on Waste Minimisation. Yes. Report. And that way we can all get some time to get a bit of background on that as well. Mm. Bear with me one moment while I just type this up. I'm enjoying the, the space, the breath. <laughs> Councillor Hayward, are you getting ready with your, your karakia? I'm good to go, thank you. Right, when, when we get this one through, it'll be your, our time to shine. <laughs> So pop, pop that up when you're ready, Heidi. Just before we go into this, um, I just want to thank you all. And just to note that we should really just get those phone numbers out there so that mm. if any of us want to have discussion about this, I think it would be very useful. Councillor Taylor, what's the flash building in your background? Uh, that is our railway station. Well worth oh, a visit. Oh, yeah, good. It's been good. Oh, nice. <laughs> Apologies for the delay. There we go. Going very well. Thank you very much. Duplication there. Sorry about that. Adjourns the. Great. And so that is moved by Councillor Elliott and seconded yeah. by me. Can we put that to the vote, Heidi? Uh, yep, one moment. Uh, yes. So just waiting on votes from Councillor Hayward and Councillor Greathead. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Thank right. you. Yay. OK. Well, um, I will declare this meeting closed. And once again, I thank you all for being here today. It's great to see you all. I really hope we see you in person next time. Um, but also look forward to the next forum. Actually, is that August sometime? Is that being put back to another date? Anyway, I hope to see you then before the next committee meeting. Um, and on that, I will ask uh, Councillor Haywood to, to send us off with a karakia. Um, kia ora fire, kia ora um, councillor phone and all. Um, let's begin. Kia tau, kia tātou katoa, 
te ātawhai o tō tātou āriki i ihu kraiti, me te aroha o te ātua, me te whiwhinga tahitanga ki te wairua tāpū. Āke, 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 āmene. Āmene, ok. Yay, thanks everybody. Maybe, oh, right on time. <laughs> Kia ora, Councillor Edwards, was that a wave or a, do you want to cut a care as well? 